Hi, my name's Tom with some more ATPL tips. Today we're looking at altimetry. This is something that will come up in GNAV, it'll come up in instruments, and it'll come up in your meteorology exam as well. So this is a really useful thing for you to get your head around as early into your ATPL studies as possible. As ever, the purpose of this video is to try to help you get the best possible score on your ATPL exams. I'm going to try to take you through from the very basics to being able to answer all those questions about true altitude with as little stress as possible. But this is definitely one of those areas where you're going to have to practice, practice, practice. Altimetry can be a particularly tricky subject. So the way I'm splitting uh, this series up is that in the first video, I'll start with some relatively simple theory that's actually really, really easy to misunderstand. That's QFE, QNH, and QNE, and the relationship that they have with each other. Video two will build upon this foundation to dig into density altitude and true altitude and I'll show you the method that I use to answer a couple of sample questions. And then video three will be more questions. Questions, 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 to try and uh, reinforce this method and help you get your head around it. To play along at home, you'll need a pen or pencil, you'll need some paper, and you'll need a calculator. So in the world of altimetry, we have a few different reference settings that we can use. Um, here's an airfield. Uh, let's pretend it's Oxford. Um, and firstly, let's look at QFE. Think of QFE as field elevation. It's the altimeter pressure setting that will read zero feet when you are on the ground at an airfield. So when we're on the ground in Oxford, with QFE set on our altimeters window, our altimeter will read more or less zero feet. That's fine locally, um, but not good when you start traveling away from the aerodrome because the elevation of the ground beneath you is changing all the time. And so we also use QNH. Think of QNH as nautical height. It's the pressure measured at sea level. If we set QNH in our altimeter whilst we're on the ground, we'll get the elevation of the airfield above sea level. London Oxford Airport has an elevation above sea level of 269 feet. So if we set the local QNH on our altimeter, it will read 269 feet. Although there are various instrument errors and tolerances um, that may mean it doesn't read 269 feet, but that is for instruments. I'm not going into that here. QNH applies to a wider area than QFE. So it's better for when we want to leave the vicinity of the aerodrome. Since the elevation of our airfield in Oxford isn't changing, um, rising sea levels notwithstanding, the relationship between QNH and QFE is constant. So if you know the elevation of the airfield and you know one of the pressure settings, you can work out the other one. And that is because, generally speaking, for exam questions, you can assume that one hectopascal is equivalent to 27 feet. I hear some of you shouting at me. Some books will tell you that one hectopascal is equivalent to 30 feet. And depending on whether you're doing GNAV, you're doing meteorology, or you're doing instruments, Different books within the same series, made by the same publisher, uh, will tell you to use a different reference figure as well. The reality is that across my entire ATPL uh, exam journey, I think I only had maybe two questions that came up in the exam where they actually didn't tell me uh, what, what reference figure to use. For the sake of this, I'm going to use 27 feet per hectopascal. I think it's slightly more accurate than using 30, but as we'll see when we do some exam questions later, sometimes the, um, sometimes the questions on offer are assuming that you've used 30, they're assuming that you've used 27, and so you get some slight discrepancies. Now, don't be misled by this. As I said, in almost every exam question that I had, I was told whether to use 27 
or 30. The difference with the question banks that are out there is that they don't always tell you that. So you can go through a whole question, you can spend 10 minutes working out a true altitude question, then get to the end, discover that your answer doesn't really look like anything that's on the page, discover that you should have used 27 instead of 30, or 30 instead of 27, and all that leads to is a load of grumpy comments in the question banks comment section. Don't worry about that, almost all the time they will tell you what reference figure to use. I know some people do these exams before doing any flying, but for the rest of us who've sat in a little plane and listened to ATIS or been given airfield information before, you'll know that QNH and QFE figures will vary over time. But the elevation of the airport, in this case Oxford, um, it's not variable, it's fixed. So with that in mind, we can take our airfield elevation of 269 feet and we can divide it by 27. Because there are 27 feet per hectopascal. And we can see that the difference between QNH and QFE at London Oxford Airport will always be 10 hectopascals. Now will it be more or will it be less? Well, a fundamental fact to understand is that pressure decreases with height or altitude. So for an airport that is above sea level, the QFE will be lower than the QNH. That means that if the QNH is 1034, the QFE is going to be 1024. Similarly, if our QNH is 1009 hectopascals, our QFE will be 999 hectopascals. So formula number one to understand is that QFE is equal to our QNH minus the elevation of the airfield divided by 27. Below sea level, the QFE is going to be higher than QNH. This formula will still work um, for airfields below sea level because we're subtracting a negative number and you know that two negatives make a positive. Okay. Hopefully that's fine with you. Field elevation is fixed, but QNH is variable, so our QFE will vary linearly accordingly. But there's another pressure setting that we use too, and that's QNE, also known as the ISA standard atmosphere. This is the reference model that uses uh, 1013.25 hectopascals as the standard. Obviously, different airfields at different elevations will have a different distance between their QNH and their QFE, but let's stick with Oxford for the moment. Uh, let's assume we have a day where our measured QNH is 1009 hectopascals. So our um, QFE is going to be 999 hectopascals. That places our ISA QNE level further down than our QNH. Our QNH is a lower pressure than ISA, but QNH is the measured nautical height. It doesn't change, so ISA must be below sea level. Remember that ISA is only a reference model. Uh, it's not the real data for any given moment. But what if our measured QNH is higher than 1013? Let's say we've got a QNH of 1020, and therefore a QF QFE of 1010. Well, in that scenario, our ISA QNE reference will be higher than sea level. Remember, QNH is a specific height with variable pressure. QNE is a specific pressure with a variable height. Let's expand this a little further. Okay, here's a plane with its flight path. As it moves along its route, if it uses QFE as an altimeter setting, it will read height above the airfield from where the QFE has been taken. This is good for very local flying, like staying in the circuit. If the aircraft is departing the immediate vicinity of the airfield, it will be given a QNH setting, allowing it to read its altitude relative to the current pressure at sea level. This is fine, but more broadly runs the risk of aircraft with D 
different pressure settings all being in the same area at the same time, and that could cause confusion and maybe be quite dangerous. This is why the transition altitude layer and level exist. Above the transition layer, aircraft use the ISA standard reference 1013 and report altitude in terms of flight level, also known as pressure altitude. This is great because it means that planes are all reading from the same scale, but the problem with this um, is that, as previously shown, the location of the QNE 1013 level that flight level is based upon changes depending on what the atmosphere around the plane is actually doing. As you can see, this can mean a loss of separation to terrain, and this is why altimetry questions exist within the syllabus of three different ATPL subjects. It's really, really important that you understand the purpose and the pros and the cons of each setting. To summarize, QFE gives us height above an airfield, QNH gives us altitude above sea level, and QNE gives us flight level. And this is also known as pressure altitude. So how do we work out pressure altitude? Well, here's a formula that you need to know. Pressure altitude equals the current elevation plus 1013 minus the QNH times 27. Let's do a question. Okay, so given an airfield elevation of 1000 feet, a QNH of 988 hectopascals, what's the pressure altitude? Well, let's write this out based on the formula we've just done. So elevation is 1000 feet plus two sets of brackets, 1013 minus 988 times 27. Well, let's get the calculator and see what happens. 1013 minus 988 equals 25 times 27 is 675. 1000 plus 675 is going to give us 1675. So I'm going to go for option C here, uh, which is 1680. Now, this is a really good example of how the answers that you get may not always be absolutely spot on. In fact, you can see the question numbers that I've listed here from um, AVEXAM, ATPL questions and ATPL GS. If you go and look at those questions on those banks, a couple of the banks actually use 30 feet as a um, as a reference per hectopascal. And so actually, if we were to plug that in, in fact, let's do it. If you do that now as um, 1013 minus 988, and multiply that by 30. So let's just start again, 1013 minus 988 equals times 30. You get 750. So your pressure altitude that you'd see there is 1750. And that is the answer that a couple of the banks give. But this is a great example of how different banks do things slightly differently. And the reality is in the exam, if you're given that question, well, those answers are so wildly far apart, it's gonna be obvious which one they're expecting you to choose. And also, they're probably gonna tell you whether to use 27 or 30. Incidentally, I don't have a subscription to Bristol, uh, Bristol's Question Bank. If you do, I'd love it if you could uh, find that question and leave in the comments section below this video what the question number is on Bristol for this particular question. Hopefully questions about pressure altitude aren't too complicated. Um, we're not going to do any more of these now because pressure altitude calculations come up within true altitude calculations, which we'll get to later on. And they should be quite familiar to you from uh, performance calculations when you were doing your private pilot license. Now's a really good time to take a break. In the next video, we're going to dig into density altitude and true altitude. And I'm going to show you the method that I use to attack true altitude questions um, to try and get you through these exams as successfully as possible. Thanks for watching. 
Uh, like, subscribe if you don't already, and um, I'll see you in the next video.